Welcome to this week's Fit for Purpose podcast. This week, I'm really delighted to be joined by someone I've known for quite a while now, actually, Professor Nick Beach. Um, He's Vice Chancellor of the University of Salford. And it's going to be fantastic to talk with Nick really about how important that university has always been locally and regionally, but also increasingly nationally, but also his plans as a somewhat new Vice Chancellor at Salford for how he wants to really open it up to that wider community. Nick, thanks so much for being part of the the Fit for Purpose podcast. I mean, maybe we'll just start by telling us a little bit about the University of Salford, because in a sense, its story is almost the story of industry and and the growth of Manchester, I, I guess, over quite a long time. It is. And thanks, thanks, Justin. Really delighted to to be here and to to have the chance to be on the podcast. Um, So University of Salford is a Robbins era, 1960s university. And like many of the universities that um, became universities in the 1960s, we've got a long history actually as a a technical institute. So back into the 1800s. And we were so we were always a, a really essential part of the city here and Salford is its own city, but it's also a really, really innovative space. So Salford here and where I'm sitting in the campus, we're right next to Peel Park, which was in fact the first public access park in the UK. Um, we've just had the, a big festival this weekend in our Media City campus called We Invented the Weekend. And <laughs> strangely, they did. Um, so behind the movement, that gave workers leisure time on Saturday afternoons in the early 1800s. That was a movement of people from Salford that did it. So the the university has always been that sort of quite engaged um, approach to education, not a separate approach. And secondly, that Robbins era element for us is really important because it's about a form of education that is about widening access and participation so that the real opportunities are there for everybody. But also the research that we do tends to be highly engaged. It's not just disciplines defining their own problems to Mm -hmm. work on. It's Mm -hmm. very much about picking up on what are the real issues that people are trying to work on in businesses, in the local council, in the health service and so on. What are their issues and how do we bring uh, skills and abilities to help solve some of those problems? So that's been a long tradition here. And as a relative newcomer, it's lovely to come into into that tradition and and hopefully see how we can move that forward in a productive way. And in terms of numbers of students that you've got, just to give people a sense of how big, how many many are at Salford? So it's around 30,000 students. Mm -hmm. um, And we also have a campus in Bahrain, which is quite important to us. So it's the British University of Bahrain. Mm -hmm. uh, And we've got various other overseas activities as well. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned those not because they're in some sense a distraction from what we do within Salford, but because that connection internationally is utterly crucial to how we do really high quality experience and education here by connecting the students between those campuses. And so right at home then, I know one of your passions is really around how Salford can be, you know, that sort of civic university that's really having a, a social impact woven through everything you do and and into that that local community I think it'd be really good just to talk about some of those ideas you know you talked about you know the park next door and if you like the campus itself how, how do you see that relationship with that local community and in a sense how do you want to change it over time and, and open it up well I, I see it fundamentally as a symbiotic relationship that actually we both not just need each other, but we hugely benefit from being with each other and working alongside. And so the idea that we've, we've built into the middle of our strategy, um, you know, being a relatively new VC, of course, you have to have a new strategy. And at the heart of that are two things. One is our mission, which is innovating to enrich lives. And all of those words are quite deliberate. So it is about innovation and it is about technological innovation, our history, but also the huge amount of work that goes on here in social innovation, in health innovation, in creative innovation. Mm-hmm. So it's a very people orientation to the way we operate. And enriching lives is really crucial to us. So when we were talking to our students, to members of the local community, people really don't like, and they're quite right in my view, to not like 
a deficit model. It's not that we are going to ride in and say there's something wrong with you and we're going to fix it. It's not mm -hmm. that at all. It is about building on the strengths, the real character, the community that exists here, and then asking how can we help contribute to that. Well, so bringing that back to the other part of your question, it's about collaborative advantage, how we work together to achieve outcomes that we couldn't possibly do otherwise. And I'll just give you a, a couple of little flavors of that. So we do a lot of work on creative and cultural industries. Mm -hmm. And we recently had a fantastic photographic ex exhibition by um, a, a, an internationally renowned uh, photographer who's won pretty much every award um, <laughs> around the world. Wonderful, wonderful work, works of art that he's doing. But alongside that, we had funding for a social change project, which took young people from an area where they were really struggling, to be honest, to engage with education, um, to get outside their bedrooms and engage with mm -hmm. society more broadly. So they each had a camera and we went through a week, um, weekly process with them in which they produced their own photographic um, response to the art that was being done. And then turned up at the uh, big launch event and were able to speak about that so movingly. I mean, nobody who was there can forget the impact of what they said about how it had really changed them. And so for us, it's that, how do we put into connection really great work that in one sense is internationally leading and really great work that is intensely local, focused on the people in their situation mm. and see what change you can bring about by linking and the two. And in a sense, you being the connector um, yeah. and the fact that actually for Salford, you've got young people growing up literally in the shadow of the media city. Yeah. This fantastic set of, um, you know, businesses and, and this creative sector that's right on the doorstep. And yet this being a creative sector that often hasn't been anywhere near as diverse as we all know in terms of who's who makes it up and so almost the university being able to play this crucial role in just connecting that fantastic local talent up to some of these sectors that really need their diversity yeah no you're, you're absolutely spot on and you know there's th this is a wonderfully innovative place so there's mm -hmm. loads of firsts that were, were achieved here including things like the park and the first ever lending library the one that i'm particularly excited about is that of course on the 2nd of April, 1817, the world's first angling society was formed <laughs> here in, in Salford. But, you know, there's all of this innovation and you're yeah. right now, it's very techy and we share a building with the BBC and work with them all the time. Mm -hmm. And yet, actually, Salford as a city is the 18th most deprived area in England, 18th mm -hmm. worst out of 317. So, you know, we need to move that innovation to make a difference in those people's lives and so that is about the way we reach out in terms of health in terms of um, mm -hmm. being a child-friendly city and the role of adults in that it's around social justice and how we can really move on all of those fronts and the university um obviously has its own involvement with local schools and it's probably worth just yeah. talking a little bit about you know some of that core outreach that you do as a university pretty much every day yeah and so the the ethos of collaborative advantage is that we want the boundaries around us to be as, as absolutely low as possible mm -hmm. and to be as porous as possible so that we are out all the time and people come in all the time. So we run an institute of technology which links all of the local colleges in the area. Yeah. Um, so we're working on, in that way all the time. Our students actually do fantastic work on tutoring and we work a lot with the Tutor Trust mm -hmm. um, who are then providing a collaborative form of tutoring into schools. and. One of the things that's important about that is we have quite a lot of students who come from the area or from Greater Manchester. Mm -hmm. And tutoring isn't just about the knowledge. It's often about young people thinking, well, if they're doing it, perhaps I could. Mm -hmm. um, and the confidence. Connecting in a different way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so we work with into university and all of those sorts of things that mean we're very present in schools. But what I hope is we do that in a way that is entirely supportive of their agenda rather than us trying to impose anything. And I guess the other point I really wanted to, to come to as well was the other end of the pipeline. And in a sense, that heritage that you've got of the technical colleges rooted in industry, this incredible shift almost over time to update that sector to become 
media city, literally this embodiment almost of what 21st century economies look like. But it's probably worth talking about that that opportunity footprint of Salford, actually, not just what you're doing through the schools and, if you like, yourself as a university connect up those young people, but that much bigger role that you play in driving the local economy, entrepreneurship, being a local employer yourself. Yeah, so um, I, th- I think there's a couple of different angles on that. One is that um, universities often can produce through the staff and through the students, actually, uh, spin outs and that's been a really important part of what we've done and we tend to um, probably produce more of those per person than, than many universities just because I think we have that sort of entrepreneurial uh, mm-hmm. way of thinking mm-hmm. in our student population. Secondly we do a huge amount of work with SMEs so uh, over 1,200 that have been through the kind of innovation support process here and just to give you one or two examples of that we have the a big robotics centre for the whole of the north of England. And in that, one of their specialities is working precisely with SMEs who normally don't have any access at all to robotics. Mm -hmm. And yet robotics linked to AI is one of the crucial things that's going to enable them to work quite different ways. So we've got SMEs in and out of the robotics centre all the time, uh, alongside that they do a lot of work in health and um, robots are helping surgery and so on. So that's really crucial. Linked to that... Um, a huge amount of work of getting people into employment in the first place and to then be working in the SMEs, especially when they're coming from areas and backgrounds that have got huge challenge. So they might be care providers in a particular way. They might have all sorts of other responsibilities. And so we offer everything from business startup advice to legal advice to incubators, mm-hmm. all, all of that sort of stuff. But coming back to what I was saying earlier, it's crucial for, for us that that's not seen as being kind of an add-on. That's mm-hmm. at the heart of what we do. And the mm-hmm. students are involved, the staff are involved as a kind of part of their normal work. The brilliant thing that happens out of that is, of course, those businesses come back in and they then work with future students so that there's a really positive virtuous cycle. Yeah. So it's almost like a continuous improvement approach, really, where you're steadily yeah. building up those relationships, supporting that, that local and regional economy, particularly for SMEs, you're looking at the research and the innovation agenda that's almost going to create these new sectors yep. that will be there in the future and all of it steadily being driven through a Salford footprint that in a sense is almost so much more than just simply you run degree courses and students do them and then graduate and get a job. Yeah, you know, and there's a, I suppose there's a really old version of universities, which is about education as formation so Mm -hmm. it isn't just about can i teach you these Mm -hmm. particular skills or these chunks of knowledge because of course those things move over time enormously um i remember hearing you speak a a little while ago in which you did actually refer back to a bit of economics that sounded like it had been learned some time ago but in reality most people i didn't mean that gosh that could sound terrible i thought it was actually really relevant and very good (laughs) being retained so um but and that is true for some people, but actually for a lot of people, things that you might have learned 20 years ago or 25 years ago, if they're not in constant use, they move. And of course, the context of their, their use moves. So the idea of education as formation isn't mm. just about the content. It is about the process of learning, the process of self-renewal. And part of that is about self-confidence, that mm. people are able to go into new work situations and say, I don't know everything that's going on here, and how can I learn, and how can I adapt? And that, I would say, is has been a long tradition here with the, the university as part of the community. And so, uh, I mean, it's brilliant having you part of the Purpose Coalition because all of this is part of this Raising Standards, Creating Opportunities campaign that we've got where we've really been trying to demonstrate just how strategic that role of a university like Salford is, both working upstream, you are literally, whether it's the tutoring, whether it's the wider work you're doing with schools, helping to raise standards in all sorts of really different ways. You're driving the local economy. You've got this huge opportunity footprint. And I think you are such a good example of a university that does way more on entrepreneurship than people would probably ever recognise And in a sense, that role of the university sector in literally powering entrepreneurship, 
not just today, but creating those sectors for the future. For me, that's what's so exciting about this. You know, you're right at the, at the nexus of bringing all of those things that we need together in a sense. Yeah, no, and it, it is, I mean, it's, I, 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 perhaps I shouldn't be so excited about my job, but I actually am. It's just, <laughs> I love it, you know, and the, so wherever you go here, you find that entrepreneurial spirit. And sometimes it's a real social entrepreneurial spirit. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's more commercial. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's about a real cause, people working on sustainability and environment in brilliant ways. Um, you can probably see just the edge of a poster behind me, yes, which is yes. from a, a, actually some of our fashion students. And the work that they've done on bringing sustainability into the materials that are used and how, how they operate. And they, I mean, they show stuff in Paris. They show stuff in the leading stores, both in Manchester and London, all of this, partly because it's driven by that mm -hmm. real ethos of, you know, being courageous and being a bit different. Mm -hmm. And of course, one of the, you know, the big things, of, pieces of change for Salford really over, well, not recent years, but sort of the last 20 years has been, you know, Media City and the yeah. arrival of this almost other anchor, anchor institution called the BBC. Yeah. My sense Nick, is that that really has added this new dynamic, in a sense, for, for Salford. And what's it meant for the university itself? Because you've always had such a vocational slant to the mindset, and entrepreneurial, as you say. Presumably, yeah. it's really turbocharged that aspect of what the university's always been interested in. Oh, uh, completely. And turbocharging is a really good phrase um so i actually uh, live in sulfur keys right next to media mm -hmm. city and it's a it's a brilliant place to to be there is always something exciting going on from uh the we invented the uh, weekend festival that was this um mm -hmm. this weekend in which you got so many gigs brilliant stuff from peggy seeger amongst others for the folks fans amongst us um to the <laughs> celebration of light to all of the things that go on yeah, yeah. and we share a building with the bbc so actually we've got um people who work for the bbc who come down and talk to our students and are part of our courses and the other way. So the students go up there and work on those programs. Um, for football fans, uh, I know this is a slightly touchy topic just at the moment. Uh, <laughs> but explain if you're watching this. This is being yeah. during the beginning, no, the beginning of the Euro 2024 contest. Okie dokie. So there's a, a, a note of caution in my household with its uh, slight Scottish bias. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, anywho, if you're interested in watching replays and if you look at a lot of the TV production, a lot of the technology from that is done actually mm -hmm. by the, the staff who work for the University of Salford as well as mm -hmm. for, the, for the BBC. And that's brilliant because then the students are using the latest technology, the latest approach, um, and the flow through from their experience educationally into work is a very smooth flow because that's become part of the way we learn. So earlier on, you were saying it's not just that we kind of do standard modules and standard courses. Mm -hmm. Actually, of course, we do courses, but they are infused with both the ethos and mm -hmm. with the practicality of the workplace. And that brings around its own innovative and in ingenuity in terms of the students. And it's so interesting in a way because, you know, maybe 10 years ago, this concept of media studies, you know, would have almost being frowned on but yeah, actually the reality yeah. is when you look at the the economic benefits of media city in Salford when you you only have to switch on the Laura Koonsberg show on a Sunday and see those you know automatically moving cameras and if you like the huge technology that now goes into any element of tv production setting aside if you like the, the kind of almost pure creative element of the sector that I think you know, wherever you go in the world, people would say Britain, you know, has a, a uniquely fantastic heritage in, in some of that, that sort of, those ideas, the creativity, all of that. And actually, it's such an important sector for us, isn't it? And for, for Salford, in a sense, producing that talent, not just if you like with the technical expertise in the world of AI and, and tech just absolutely romping forward, but also that ability to bring that creative lens. Yeah. It's just crucial, isn't it? it it's crucial and deeply exciting because, um, first of all, it's that blend of creativity and technology and those two things being mm. working in a, a really sort of imbricated way with each other, which I think is very exciting. But secondly, 
coming back to the, the, the social purpose, it is also the way that we reinvent ourselves and mm -hmm. enable ourselves as part of broader society to be different. You know, young people are hugely inspired in, in fantastic ways by the people that they see on the media, the people they see producing media. So we do lots of stuff around animation and games and those sorts of areas that, you know, 20 years ago wouldn't have been imagined. Mm. And now is a major part of industry, hugely creative and technical, mm. and actually increasingly democratic in terms of the, the small and medium end of the scale that mm -hmm. you can get more involved in those businesses relatively easy. There's always barriers, but a few barriers. And then the, the interesting question, I think, is the scale-up question mm -hmm. and how those small organizations and, and sole trader approaches can start to work together in collaborations or work as part of bigger organizations. And BBC is really important to us, but actually there's a whole range of large commercial organizations in Media City as well, um, which are crucial for us. And I think it, before I want to come, I want to finish off um, talking about, in a, in a way, your own journey, but I think it reminds me of almost how powerful that Salford alumni approach is as well. And yeah. In, in a way, that ability for people to keep collaborating and partnering together as a Salford community, even when they've actually moved on from that original course they might have done at the university. And, you know, obviously I've, I've worked with many, many universities, but I think that the alumni, the strategicness of the alumni approach for Salford, I think, does stand out too. But it particularly matters, doesn't it, in these sorts of sectors, connecting people up? It, it does. And those sectors are very network based so there's mm -hmm. lots of kind of individual workers lots of small organizations and a small number of very big ones and how they connect is absolutely crucial um so we we have over two hundred thousand alumni of, of which a huge number are very very active so that they are in in contact with us mm -hmm. which are, is relatively unusual for a lot of uk universities yeah. much more common in the states for example um so that that is Brilliant. And I, I've, you know, I, I kind of, as I wander around and, and meet people in various businesses, including media, but other forms of business as well, the number of alumni that you meet is just mm -hmm. huge. Uh, yeah. And if they themselves are not alumni, their children might have been to the university or others have been. And that, that sense of connectivity and the, the kind of care and compassion, I hope, and purpose that we've got, that goes a long way. And so people actually are really keen to, to continue to continue giving, as it were, in, in that. I, was, I met somebody just the other day who said, well, actually, I think I, I'm, a, I'm a staff alumni. And I thought, well, what an interesting idea, because I normally think about students as our alumni. Mm -hmm. But she was saying, you know, she's now working in, in media and very successful. She's saying, but, you know, I want to stay connected and I want to be part of that. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is probably quite a rare thing that, you know, when people move on from one place, yeah. And move on to wherever they go to and, and yeah. actually the level of emotional connection was really strong it's brilliant and and i think in a way it's all about journeys isn't it and yeah. and not losing sight in a way of those those earlier roots because actually you know they well certainly mine definitely um shaped me but i guess i guess when we're all starting out on our career nick not many of us think i know what i'd really like to do when i get older I think I'll run a university. <laughs> it, it's funny in a in a sense. It's one of those career career roles in a way that that probably people don't think about having, but actually can be, you know, for all the reasons you've brilliantly set out and the way you've set it out, so rewarding um, to be part of. But tell us a little bit about your own journey. I mean, the twists and turns, and the, maybe the unexpected twists and turns as much as anything else. Sure. Well, it's it, yeah, it has been a long and winding road, that's for sure. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm off the scale introvert and that may not be immediately obvious in the way that we've been talking. Um, but actually, for me, the natural place to be is a backroom analyst. And the, mm -hmm. I, I loved all that. I, I, at school, I really didn't find the right subjects that connected for me. And it wasn't actually until I got to university and discovered logic that I was, I was home and this suddenly kind of mm. all made sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, but if you only focus on logic and, and bits of applied statistics that I became truly fascinated by, actually you can easily end up, you know, not connecting to other people. Mm. And so mm -hmm. I also ended up studying social anthropology, 
which mm. was another huge journey for me. Um, and, 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 and a realization actually that I was really interested in that kind of connectivity between mm-hmm. you know, what we do here, which is more technological and people oriented, but you know, there's different ways of thinking of that. So that, mm. that was kind of true for me. And, um, I didn't immediately become an academic. I, I worked outside universities for a bit and then came back in um, largely through other people's agency and um, being invited in to do some tutorial sessions. And I just loved it. I just loved the students. Um, and so I applied for a job, assuming I wouldn't get it because I didn't have a PhD or anything. Um, mm-hmm. And bizarrely got so the job. You've, you've left university you're, what, in some analyst role by the sounds of it. No, and I was... I, I, at the time when it came back in, I was working in HR, but again, at that sort of okay. Um, yeah. And then I, I, uh, because I had the opportunity to do some um, work in some seminars and tutors, that became a thing that I was deeply interested in. And so I, I then applied for a job and moved into universities and didn't really know what I was doing at all, to be very honest. Oh. Um, it was a kind of crazy time of uh, writing out acetates at midnight the night before giving a lecture the next morning. <laughs> And not understanding at all what research was but uh, i was then in strathclyde university which is actually a, a similar it's a robins era university yeah and really really ambitious and, and i worked in business schools um and at that time of course business schools are there's a couple of things about them one mm-hmm. tend to be very social science so it was, it was a place that was very good to be if you were interested like me in anthropology and other things um but also it was a place of social mobility. You know, it's the yeah, big absolutely. disciplinary area that people aspire to and then move on through. And that was kind of true for me as well. So I started doing a PhD part-time and that's always been a real, you know, something that's lived with me for a long time. And I was teaching a lot of part-time students, but studying part-time and then trying to build up a research career. Uh, and then I moved to St. Andrews and that was lovely. And I spent a lot of time there researching with the creative industries and, and other things. And during that time, there was a, a change in the leadership structure in the department that I was in. And so with two other people, I became joint head of school. Mm-hmm. And that was a, I mean, it was a terrible time really, because I was on, I got a big ESRC fellowship. I'd got a huge amount of external stuff going on. And, but actually the opportunity to just do something a bit different with the yeah. school. And, and at very... this stage, Nick, did you suddenly, was there a point when you thought, actually, this is what I'm doing, isn't it? It's not going yet. to be, no. but not quite. That's what I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, you're steadily in this space and it's becoming more important and it's a bit more of a fixture in your, in what you're doing. And then, yeah, you finally get this sort of joint leadership role and it's all starting to come together, isn't it? It is. Um, but again, that was done on a very collegiate fashion mm-hmm. and we deliberately had three of us as co-heads which was <laughs> unusual at the yeah, time very unusual um but that meant that we got more diversity in it we got different mm-hmm. ways of thinking different genders mm-hmm. and so on um and gradually exactly what you're saying it kind of dawned on me that i actually really like this stuff and mm-hmm. one of the other three said to me you you like the broader canvas don't you you like being able to paint with big brushes on a big space mm-hmm. and i became Dean of a brilliant, brilliant faculty there, um, which had got everything from divinity and classics and ancient languages through to economics and management, uh, perhaps at the other end. And I just loved that. I just loved learning yeah. from what people were doing. And then I became a vice principal there. Um, and then I moved on from that. And at that stage, I was, I still wasn't thinking I wanted to be a vice chancellor, but I just yeah. moved on and became provost at Dundee. And that was brilliant because it's huge life sciences and medicine, a brilliant art school. And so I was just, I was just being happy all the way through. It's just yeah, going yes, and it's learning just, it's from It's an accidental career journey that <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. you're really enjoying what you're doing and you think, I'll take the next step. But it, it's not necessarily with this destination in mind. Not at all. No, no. Mm-hmm. But I think the, the thing that's drawn me through, and then I was at Middlesex as VC yeah. there and then to solve it. But the thing that's drawn me through is this just fascination with what can we do as part of society as a community? Mm-hmm. How can we bring really fantastic research and education together and to do that within a civic setting? That, that's the thing that has pulled me through. So I'm now doing another part-time doctorate wow. on, on, on higher education leadership because I thought it's about time I'd worked out what it, what it is I'm meant to be doing. Um, 
And but it's, it's just, I like staying connected in that sort of way. And it's, it's, I mean, it's just, it is, it is a joy and a privilege, frankly. Mm. And it's, I mean, I think for you in this particular role now, it's sort of, if you have a Venn diagram of, you know, the, the versions of Nick Beach, it, it sort of touches on all of them, doesn't it, really? It does. And it's complete food for almost all of your, you know, all your skill set and interest and, and what really, what really inspires you, I feel. Yeah, that's, that's completely right. And the thing that I would add on to it is, I also find it quite challenging. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I started out by saying my natural place in some senses, or certainly when I was younger, my natural place would be in the back room, not, you know, on yes. stage in the front. Yeah. So I have to really make myself do that. But I practiced it. I really learned from and with others, and I love being able to, to be there and do it. So I don't, you know, all, all of these steps, you know, it's not just entirely unintended, the, you, yes. you want to do things but also you've got to try and challenge yourself I think mm. and I think it's a really great point to finish on because I think when we're growing up we often you know see particular leaders in the business pages or in magazines and you know you get this impression that this is a straight line mm. you know that, that it's it, it's just on on the up the whole time and actually, the reality is, first of all, it's never like that at all, actually. Um, no. We all meander around quite a lot in our careers. That's quite normal. But I think the other really interesting thing about what you've said is there's space for all sorts of people in leadership. And actually, it takes that breadth of different sorts of people. If everyone was the same, actually, it would be, A, pretty boring, but B, it's the diversity of those leadership voices like yours in the sector yeah. that really make the difference. And there'll be people listening and watching to this pod, watching this podcast who think, well, I'm an, I'm an introvert. And I thought I had to be an extrovert to be able to lead. And actually, no, it just means you'll have your different style. Um, but it can be a style, you know, as you, you can tell people, that can be hugely effective and, and valued, if you like, by others around you. Yeah, I think I think you're 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 right, and we do need more diversity in leadership. And as part of what I'm doing at the moment, I've been interviewing other VCs about their journey. Um, mm -hmm. and now I've done thirty three, thirty four interviews. I, I've not come across anybody that started out, you know, as a, a kind of young academic thinking I'd like to be a VC, <laughs> you know. But yeah. actually, I think it's really good. Those, those bits of meandering that you talked about are vital because yes. if you want to do these sorts of roles, you've got to be able to connect and listen to people and learn from them. And mm -hmm. I think there's two things for that. One, that you can ask questions that show them that you're really interested. And two, that you've got enough humility. And sometimes there's an element of vulnerability that is at the heart mm -hmm. of genuine learning that you are yeah. willing to change yourself. So I, I've deliberately tried to enact a different way of being to the way that would have just been natural for me. But I'm doing it with a purpose. And that's, that's why I keep going. Brilliant. It, Nick, it's been such a pleasure to do the podcast today. It's run a bit longer, but actually I, I think it's been absolutely fantastic. And I think in a way you've really brought alive that role of being a VC. And in a sense, you've also brought alive why I love having the universities like Salford pass the Purpose Coalition, because, you know, in a sense, you're my inspiration and, and food for my kind of soul and my brain. And you know, I think in many respects, it's sort of what feeds the rest of the work that we do with our businesses, because actually universities are the ones that have been doing social mobility for a very long time. And, you know, we're now getting a lot of companies to think as strategically as all, all you've been, including Salford. Anyway, Nick, we need to finish, but it's been an absolute pleasure. Nick Beach from Salford, thank you so much for doing the podcast today. Thank you so much, Justine. Really enjoyed it.